Our next topic is rotational motion. And so I have a little worksheet for you to work on. It's called Ants on a Fan. And this presentation, after you do the worksheet on your own, will go through with the solution and you should take notes. But the whole purpose of this worksheet is for you to think about this on your own and use a little bit of logic and a little bit of circle geometry and maybe the simple little formula speed equals distance over time to figure out some key concepts in rotational motion, some variables, and some relationships. Here are four mastery objectives that we'll be working on as you go through this worksheet. First of all, you're going to figure out what uniform circular motion is. You'll be able to come up with your own examples. Next, you'll see some relationships between linear motion and rotational motion. You'll also learn about some different variables and units that we use for rotational motion. And finally, you'll be learning about tangential velocity. So here's the scenario we'll be working on. We've got a big industrial size ceiling fan that has a two meter long blade from the center of the fan all the way out to the edge. And we've got three ants on the fan. Don't ask me why they're there. One's a half a meter from the center. One's one meter from the center, or double the first ant. And one's all the way out the edge, two meters from the center, which is four times the first ant. This ceiling fan is going to be turned on and it'll be whirling around at a constant rotational speed of 100 RPM. And of course, RPM means revolutions per minute. This, by the way, is our definition of uniform circular motion. We've got an object that is moving around at a constant rate of speed. So we've got these objects moving around at a constant rate of speed. I've introduced a new variable to you already, and that's the lowercase variable omega. And that's a small version of the capital omega I'm sure you're familiar with. Typically use counterclockwise as the positive direction. But of course, you can define directions any way you like. In mathematics, for example, we do quadrants 1, 2, 3, 4 in the counterclockwise fashion, which is similar to this. The units for omega, our angular velocity or angular speed, can vary. Radians per second, degrees per second, revolutions per minute, etc. I don't really know if you could call one of these MKS, both radians per second and degrees per second have the seconds in it. Radians are unitless. Degrees are really Earth-based because they relate to how many days it takes to go around the sun. So perhaps aliens might like radians per second the best. I mean, generally speaking, we'll use that more often than not when we're doing physics problems. I'm going to use the word rotation and revolution as if they're the same word. And just remember, one rotation is the equivalent of going around a circle 360 degrees, or as you know from pre-calculus, that's 2 pi radians. So first, let's calculate how far each ant travels in one rotation. And of course, to do that, all we need to do is calculate the circumference. And I'm doing that right here. And you'll see that the circumference is 1 pi meters for the first ant, ant A, 2 pi for ant B, and 4 pi for ant C. Typically, I don't leave the pi's in my calculations for physics. And so typically, I would use 3.14 meters, 6.28 meters, etc. But for the purposes here, I'll keep it the pi in. You'll notice that as I double the radius, my distance that I travel doubles as well. Another thing to keep in mind here is what's the difference between distance and displacement. If we travel one time around the circle, what's the distance traveled versus what's the displacement traveled? Next, let's figure out how long it takes for the ants to complete one revolution. So we're looking for a time here. So we're given some angular or rotational speed here. This is uniform circular motion, so we're going to keep this as a constant rate of speed. So we've got 100 revolutions in one minute. So we need to find the time for one rotation. So the method we're going to use here is, since we're given the number of rotations per time units, we actually want to find the time per rotation unit. So it looks like we're going to take a reciprocal here. So I'm taking my rotational speed, 100 revolutions per minute, taking the reciprocal. And I'm just divvying up my fraction a little bit here in a little different way. And then I'm going to do a, a simple unit cancellation here, conversion, to go from minutes to seconds. And what I get is 0.6 seconds for one revolution. And I just did that at real time speed. And you can see 100 RPMs is a lot faster than I was showing on the previous slide. I'll do that again. There is one revolution in 0.6 seconds. This time, which we use a capital T for, is a special variable called the period for this cyclic motion. 
You've seen this before when you did pre-calc, that's when you're looking at sinusoidal functions, sine, cosine, and tangent, where you're plotting those out. You were talking about the period of these functions. So keep in mind that all of the ants are on the same fan blade, so they've got to be moving together. So the angular speed of A has to be the same as B, which has to be the same as C. Therefore, the time that it takes to go around once, which is the period, must be the same for all of the ants. Next, let's figure out how do we go from this rotational speed into an equivalent linear speed. In other words, if these things were just traveling around along the road at this speed, how long would they be traveling if they were moving in one dimension instead of a circular dimension? Well, I think we can use a little logic to do that. There's my one time around my racetrack here. So here's what we know. We just calculated the distance they travel in one rotation. We also calculated the time it takes for one rotation. So of course, if we want to calculate speed, we know the distance, we know the time, so we can just use our good old friend speed equals distance over time to calculate how fast they're moving around this circle. For ant A, he's moving at pi divided by 0.6, which is 5.24 meters per second. Ant B, the circumference is twice as much as ant A, so we should expect that to double the speed, and it does. In the same sense, ant C has double the radius of B, so that's going to be double the last number, which it is. All right, what direction are these three ants moving? Well, at the instant in time where they're actually passing through the 3 o'clock point here, and I'm, as you notice, I'm going to use a little clock up here as a reference. So as these three ants are passing through the 3 o'clock point, remember they're going counterclockwise, they're moving upward. And so I've actually drawn in the tangential velocity vectors. These are called tangential velocities that we've just calculated. And I've drawn them to scale. Now what if we were to look at their tangential speeds at the 12 o'clock position? Well, at the 12 o'clock position, they're still moving at the same uniform speed around the circle. And all I've done is they've changed the direction. Now they are moving directly to the left at the 12 o'clock position. So as I mentioned before, this instantaneous speed at any point in time is called the tangential speed of the object as it goes around the circle. And these are tangent to the circle. If you notice, if we draw a radius through the circle, we do have a right angle that would form in each one of these cases. So that's why it's a tangential velocity. And you'll notice, as our radius doubled, so did our tangential velocity. So now let's calculate the ant's angular velocity, omega, in degrees per second. You'll recall we were given revolutions per minute to begin with. So we were given a 100 RPM speed to start with. And what we're going to do is we're going to use dimensional analysis and unit cancellation to figure out all these other calculations. And just keep in mind, one revolution and rotation, they're the same thing, which is 360 degrees or 2 pi radians. And we need to convert this into degrees per second. So minutes need to go to seconds, and revolutions need to go to degrees. So here's my conversion to go from revolutions into degrees. And I just need to go from minutes into seconds. And so there's my cancellation to go from minutes into seconds. And I end up with an angular velocity of 600 degrees per second. Once again, all these ants are traveling on the same fan blade, and they all move around the circle at the same rate. So their angular velocity is the same for all of them. It's 600 degrees per second. Of course, there's more than one way to skin the cat. And so here's an alternative way to calculate the same value. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the period, which is the capital T, and I'll use my speed equals distance over time relationship. And we started out with a period of 0.6 seconds, and we're looking for an angular velocity. So using speed equals distance over time, well, speed, in a rotational sense, we use the variable omega. And instead of a distance we're traveling, we're actually traveling an angle as we come around this circle. So if we were to travel 90 degrees, for example, I'd go from the 3 o'clock position all the way up to the 9 o'clock position. And our time is just time. And so I'm going to use this new, slightly modified angular speed equals angular position over time to calculate my angular speed in degrees per second. So I'm going to just substitute in for my position. 360 degrees is going to be the distance I'll be traveling, angular distance. And the time that it takes to complete one revolution is called the period, which is 0.6 seconds. And once again, you get 600 degrees per second for your answer. So two ways to find the same quantity. Now let's use the same process to figure out the angular velocity in radians per second. So we're given an angular speed of 100 RPM. And we can use dimensional analysis and unit cancellation again. 
So we're given our initial value of 100 RPM, revolutions per minute. And we want to convert this revolutions into radians and our minutes into seconds. Well, we know that one revolution is 2 pi radians. So here's our first conversion I'll do. Revolutions cancel, and we're left with radians per minute. And now we need to cancel out minutes into seconds. And we do our calculation, and we find out our angular velocity in radians per second is about 10.5 radians per second. That's rounded a bit. And once again, all the ants are moving at the same rate around the circle, and so they all have the same angular velocity of 10.5 radians per second counterclockwise. Once again, we can use an alternative method to do this using our good old formula speed equals distance over time. But we'll use the rotational equivalent of that. Angular speed equals our angular position divided by time. And the angular position we're going through is 2 pi radians in 0 0.6 seconds. That's our period. And remember, our period is a time to go around once. When we calculate that, once again, it matches what we had before. It's 10.5 radians per second. Once again, important formula to remember and know here is just the rotational equivalent of our, our linear speed equation. So now let's calculate how many rotations the ants make each second. So I gave you a hint on this problem to look at number two, use the period. So the period I found is there's 0 0.6 seconds for one revolution. So that's what we know. I wrote it as a fractional form. and I need to find the rotations per second. I'm given seconds for per rotation. I need rotations per second. So our methodology is, well, you guessed it. We're going to look at the units and where it's going to take the reciprocal. So we're looking for rotation second. We're given seconds per rotation. I'm just going to take the reciprocal. I'll calculate that. And I get about 1.67. It's actually 1.6 repeating revolutions per second. That is known as another special quantity called our frequency. We use a small f for this variable. So let me just show you how many revolutions we move in one second at full speed here. This is actually 100 RPM for one second. So there's one and two-thirds revolutions in one second. So other acceptable units that we could use for frequency, I've started with revolutions per second. We can also count how many cycles, how many complete cycles that we move per second. We can also, if we just count cycles as unitary counting numbers, we'll just call that 1 over seconds. And of course, that looks like seconds to the minus 1 power. There is a very common engineering notation used for this, and it's also used in physics, named after another scientist. And the first person who can send me a note on Facebook that tells me what this quantity is, or these units are, I will give you two bonus points. So this small f, which we call frequency, which is also equal to 1 over t, and that's an important relationship to memorize. That is our frequency for the cyclic motion. And once again, in pre-calculus and sinusoidal functions, we were plotting sine, cosine, and tangent functions. You should have recognized this word frequency from that discussion you had in mathematics. Once again, all these ants are riding on the same fan blade. They're all moving around at the same rate. They all have the same period. And they must also have, in that case, the same frequency. So now that we've done some introductory calculations, let's try to solve a little problem. What I've done is I've picked out a random time, 5 minutes and 29 seconds. And what I'd like to do is figure out where the three ants are after 5 minutes and 29 seconds. So what do we know? We've calculated from our work before that the period for the ants as they move around is 0 0.6 seconds. That's the time it takes them to go around one turn. The corresponding frequency, which is 1 over t, is 1.67 1 over seconds. Our angular velocity is 100 RPM, which is 600 degrees per second, which is 10.5 radians per second. And we're going to assume the ants start at the 3 o'clock position at time 0, and they're going to move counterclockwise. This sounds a lot like motion in one dimension, doesn't it? So what we're going to do, here's our clock. And I want to figure out where they land on this clock after 5 minutes and 29 seconds. So we were given a time, 5 minutes, 29 seconds. Convert that into seconds, of course, to have a common units that we can use. We can use minutes as well, I suppose. That might work well for our ro rotations per minute. And we need to find the position of the ants. Once again, let's go back to our good old formula, speed equals distance over time, or angular speed equals our angular position over time. 
And what do we know? What were we given? Well, we were given the angular speed of omega in three different forms. We've calculated it. And we're also given the time. I'm going to use the time in seconds. And if I'm going to use the time in seconds, I ought to pick out one of my units here, either 600 degrees per second or 10.5 radians per second, and use that to match up my time units. I'm going to use the 600 degrees per second. And since my unknown is my angular position theta, I'll solve for theta equals omega times time. Plug in my numbers. And we've got this nice small number, 197,400 degrees counterclockwise, this ants moved. Not a very useful number. So the question is, how do we make this a more useful number? Well, that represents a certain number of rotations. So if we divide this number by 360 degrees per rotation, we're going to find out that we have 548 and one-third rotations. Now, going back to what we want to find, we need to find the position of these very, very dizzy ants. So these ants, the 548 rotations is not the important part. It's the one-third of a rotation that's left over. So it's a remainder, if you will. And so these ants, in essence, have moved one-third of the way around the clock, or the equivalent of being on the 11 o'clock position. We've moved four out of the 12 hours on the clock. Plus, of course, another four, 548 rotations counterclockwise. So once again, all these ants are riding on the same fan blade, so they're all moving together, so they all land up at the same spot. So question eight is, which of these quantities don't change as the ant's radial position changes? And by the radial position, I want to know whether it's ant A, B, or C. If he moves from position A to position B to position C out along the edge of that fan blade, which of these variables change, which don't? Well, the answer is the first four variables don't change at all based on your radius, and only the last one does. So if we look back at some of the things we calculated before, I'd like to see if we could find a relationship mathematically between some of these variables. The first one, 9a, is just a quick little conversion of units. But the other ones, especially b and d, are quite important. So for 9a, we were given omega in degrees per second. And if we'd like to convert that into radians per second, all we need to do is convert degrees into radians. And that's an easy calculation because no, in a circle, there are 2 pi radians in 360 degrees. The units for frequency are 1 over time units, of course, which is 1 over our period. So it's 1 over seconds. Or if you want to think about it, it's the number of rotations we do in one second. So we have an object that's rotating at omega radians per second. And so what we need to do is convert that into rotations per second. We've already got radians up top on this fraction, so we need to convert those number of radians into rotations. So I'm going to use the same type of uh, conversion I did above. So essentially, what I need to do is to convert radians into rotations, and I'll end up with rotations per second. So what I'm going to do is take one rotation around a circle is equivalent to 2 pi radians. And when I do that, look at my units. I have rotations per second. My radians cancel. And so f equals omega over 2 pi. I'm just taking my omega in radians per second, dividing by 2 pi radians and I'm left with rotations per second. If I solve for omega, I find that omega equals 2 pi f. That is a very important relationship. Omega in radians per second equals 2 pi times my frequency. For the next problem, very similar. I can actually just take my result that I have above and just replace the f up here with 1 over t. And I can go ahead and solve for part 9d. Let's suppose we're in radians per second and we want to find a relationship that gets us directly to our tangential velocity. So we've got this ant, and that ant has to be at some distance from the center of our circle. Let's say it's r units from the center of the circle, and it's moving at an omega radians per second. So where's our starting point? We know that the ant moves uh, one circumference every t seconds, and of course t is our period. And once again, that allows us to use our distance over time relationship to calculate velocity. So if velocity is distance over our time, our time being our period and our distance being our circumference, we'll just plug in 2 pi r for our distance. And we'll plug in for our period. I'm going to use this relationship we found up above, 2 pi over omega. And if we simplify this complex fraction, we can cancel out the 2 pi's. We end up with our tangential velocity equals r times omega. Very simple relationship and a very important relationship. In fact, these three relationships that I've circled and highlighted 
are things that you should memorize. Remember in these cases where I'm using this omega, in these cases I'm using omega in radians per second for my unit basis. So for problem number 10, there's a few objectives. First of all, I'd like you to be able to convert from one form of units for our angular speed, omega, into another. And secondly, I'd also like you to be able to calculate our tangential velocities given an omega. And finally, sometimes you're going to be given a situation where you're not given omega directly, but you'll have to use your general knowledge to figure it out. Parts A and parts B are like that. So that's where we're going to start on these problems. Let's just figure out what our angular velocity is in each one of these cases, omega. In the first case, you have the second hand of a clock, like the clock in our classroom. I estimated the length of the hand is about 15 centimeters long. So the question is, what's the angular speed of that hand on the clock? And of course, you know what the angular speed is if you think about it. How long does it take for that hand to go around once? Well, it makes the revolution, one revolution, in 60 seconds. And that's our angular speed. It's one revolution every 60 seconds. Of course, the minute hand would take how long? That would be one revolution per 60 minutes. The hour hand would take how long? That would be one revolution per 12 hours. We can use the same methodology to figure out how fast the Earth is moving around the sun, its angular speed. Everybody knows right off the top of their head how long it takes us to go around the sun once. We move one revolution around the sun in 365 days. Of course, it's more like a 365 and a quarter days, but three significant digits, folks. On the last problem, I actually gave you the value, because I don't think anybody knows how many RPM your table saw works at, unless you happen to be a tool geek like me. The other thing you'll have to know to solve these problems is that we're going to be calculating the tangential velocity. You need to remember that when you're using this formula, our tangential velocity equals our radius times the angular velocity. We are using angular velocity units in radians per second. I'm going to fly through these calculations real quick. You can pause it and look at the calculations and look at the details. I'll just point out a couple interesting numbers that result. So here are my three conversions. And of course, the last one is to figure out how many RPMs this is. The second hand goes around at one revolutions per minute. So there you go. That's a good check of our answers. Now for our tangential velocity, that's as if we had an ant riding on the end of this 15 centimeter long second hand. And your numbers come out to be relatively low speeds. It's about 1.57 centimeters every second. So the ant can handle that pretty easily. Earth moving around the sun. Now you'll notice these are very, very, very tiny numbers compared to the numbers that we saw above in terms of our now, if we were to take a look at our tangential velocity, on the other hand, we have a huge radius. The radius from the sun is actually 149.6 million kilometers. And we're going to multiply this massive distance by this tiny angular speed in radians per second. And when we do that, we find out we're actually moving at quite a good clip around the sun, 29,800 meters per second. That's 66,600 miles per hour you're speeding along at right now. So one question you might have is, if we're speeding along at 66,600 miles per hour around the sun, how the heck are we staying on this Earth? Wouldn't we fly off the edge of the Earth and get stripped away as we speed around? That's one of the problems that people prior to Galileo had a hard time figuring out. So we're spinning around pretty quickly on the Earth. Let's compare that to a tooth at the edge of my saw blade. So the angular speed of the saw blade is 361 radians per second. And you'll notice that's about a billion times faster than the angular speed in radians per second of the Earth moving around the Sun. So it's a much faster angular speed. However, the radius obviously is a little bit smaller. In fact, the radius is 5 twelfths of a foot rather than 146 million kilometers. But we get to multiply by a fairly large radial speed. So it turns out our tangential velocity is 150 feet per second which is about 103 miles per hour. Well, not nearly as big as the Earth moving around the sun. However, how would you like it if one of those teeth, which are carbide steel teeth, flew off the blade right towards your eye and hit you in the eye at 103 miles per hour? That's why we wear safety goggles. And I've actually gotten hit in the eye with safety goggles on with one of these teeth before. And I'm glad I had my safety goggles on because I would have lost an eye if I didn't.